So first I want you to recall the first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus. And that is that if we have a continuous function on a closed interval and define our area function a sub f to be the integral from a to x of f of t dt, then this area function is differentiable and has derivative equal to f of x. So we'll need this uh, in order to prove the second part of the fundamental theorem. So here's the statement of part two of the fundamental theorem of calculus. So again, we'll let f be a continuous function on the closed interval from a to b, and we'll let big F be any antiderivative of little f. Then this definite integral is just plug in the endpoints and subtract for the antiderivative. So to give some intuition for why this should make some sense, what if f is a velocity function? right, then we know that the antiderivative of velocity should be position, right? And so we've seen before, just when talking about area, what this would mean. So if we take the definite integral or area under the curve of velocity, this should give us displacement, right? And that's going to correspond to this because what is big F of B minus big F of A? Well, that's just your end position minus your initial position. Well, that is exactly displacement, right? That's the definition. So uh, these things match up. And so that should hopefully give you some physical intuition for what is going on. Um, before we actually prove this, I want to point to why we care, right? This is often a much, much easier process than using Riemann sums to compute these definite integrals, right? Sometimes you have a nice easy life and you can use geometry, right? So sometimes you see something like square root of four minus x squared from negative two to two and you're just like, oh, hey, that's, that's a semicircle and I know what this area is. But a lot of times you're not so fortunate and rather than have to do this long process of approximating via rectangles and taking a limit, we can just use the fundamental theorem part two, and all we need to know is an antiderivative of our function. So now let's go ahead and prove uh, the fundamental theorem part two. To do so, we'll want to recall from the fundamental theorem part one that the area function here we define to be the integral from a to x of f of t dt. So why is this useful? Well, in fundamental theorem part two, we said that big F was any antiderivative of little f. Well, the area function is at least one of these antiderivatives, and then all the other antiderivatives just differ from that one by a constant. So we can say that big F is our area function plus C, since AF prime is equal to little f. So why is this useful? Well, now we're just gonna go ahead and look at that F of B minus F of A. What is this equal to? Okay, so just plugging in to the thing above, we get a f of b plus c minus a f of a plus c. Our plus c's cancel each other out. And so basically it says we may have well have just considered the antiderivative we started with. The constant doesn't really matter here. And so we get a f of b minus a f of a. Well, we can just reinterpret this, right? So a f of b is, you plug in b for x up there as your upper bound of integration, uh, upper limit of integration, and you get integral from a to b of f of t dt, and then the other one is from a to a of f of t dt. But what is this second one? I mean, this has no width, right? This is from a to a, so this guy's zero. And so we get the integral from a to b of f of t dt. And basically you can just replace t with x and well, we got what we wanted. So now let's look at an example of how to actually compute with this, okay? So again, just to point out like why this is nice. So we know what e to the x looks like, looks like something like this, right? This is negative one, natural log of two is a little bit less than one. And so we'd be talking about, you know, this area in here. But this isn't any shape we know. You could do Riemann sums, but again, like if you want to be exact, then you need to take that limit. This could be a long, tedious process. And so instead, do we know an antiderivative of e to the x? Yeah, just e to the x works, right? And so uh, the way we write this notationally 
is we go to the evaluation step. So e to the x, antiderivative of e to the x, uh, and then we go negative 1 to the natural log of 2. This bar on the right basically just says evaluate at these points and subtract. So the, the next line I write is exactly what this means. This means e to the natural log of 2 minus e to the negative 1. And then we can just simplify, right? e to the natural log of 2 is 2, and this is 1 over e. And that's what that area is. And that is super quick, just a few steps, because we know the antiderivative. All right, so now we'll do another couple of examples, just using the FTC part two, get used to it. Um, so in this case, we just want an antiderivative, right? The plus c doesn't matter because it would cancel with the subtraction. So here it's going to be z squared minus 3z. And we're evaluating at negative 2 and 6. So first we're just going to plug in 6, right? So 6 squared minus 3 times 6. Plug in negative 2. So negative 2 squared minus 3 times negative 2. And then we just figure out the algebra here, right? So this is 36 minus 18, so that's 18. This is 4 plus 6, so that's 10, 18 minus 10. And so this one is 8, right? It's the area under that line there is 8. Uh, then this next one, just wanted to get a little trig practice. So first of all, I'd like to point out that this is indeed continuous on this interval. You have to worry sometimes, right, because we're dividing by sine, so we want to make sure that sine is never 0 on the interval, and that is true from pi over 4 to pi over 2. So we can apply the fundamental theorem. Uh, so cosecant has derivative negative cosecant cotangent. So since the minus sign is missing here, instead of cosecant, we need negative cosecant. And then going from pi over 4 to pi over 2. So cosecant of pi over 2 is going to be 1, right? Because sine of pi over 2 is 1. And then this is minus a negative, so plus cosecant of pi over 4. So that's 1 over sine of pi over 4 which is 1 over root 2, so this is just root 2. Or you could think of it as root 2 over 2, and then 2 over root 2 is going to be root 2. So uh, this is our answer there. All right, and so for your first exercise, I want you to compute this definite integral using the fundamental theorem. And then for your second exercise, I want you to do basically the same thing, but just notice here, right, that this one isn't quite as straightforward because we have this 2x on the inside. So when you're doing your antiderivative, you should be a little bit careful. All right, thank you for watching.